I want to ask you a question to start off our time this morning. How many of you wish that you could hear the voice of the Lord? How many of you, yeah, a lot of us, right, wish that we could hear the tangible voice of the Lord, audibly hear his direction? Most of us wish that we could have that back and forth where where God could maybe call us to do something and we could ask follow-up questions. God could say, hey, quit your job, and we would be like, why? And he would answer. How great would that be? How great would it be to to just sit down and, and like you would have coffee with a friend, have a conversation with Jesus? Most of us wish that we could. And well, if we look in in Scripture, we see in the Old Testament, a lot of the prophets actually had that back and forth conversation with the Lord. See, Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, many others. The Lord would speak to them and they would ask questions and he would answer them. Of course, in the New Testament, we see uh, Jesus himself, the Son of God, living on earth, having conversations with the crowds, with the multitudes, with his disciples. We see that back and forth conversation because of Jesus on earth. Well, what about today? What about today where God doesn't as often or frequently speak audibly to us? It can happen, but it's far, far less frequently that we'll hear an audible voice from heaven And for many of us, that might freak us out a little bit. But God does still speak. In fact, he's never stopped speaking. And and I would make a, a very bold, but I would say true statement if we look at Scripture. God speaks more now to us than he ever has in the past. God speaks through his word. This word is not just an ancient text, but it is alive, living, and active. So every time we read it, we are hearing God speak. Not only through his word, but through prayer. Prayer is a two-way conversation where we can go before the Lord and and give our request to him, or we can worship him, or we can thank him. And we can hear his response. So the question is not, does God speak today? The question is, are you listening? Are you providing space in your life to hear God's voice speak? We often assume that God only speaks through these dynamic events or in these overly spiritual ways, where it's only in these massively huge spiritual moments where God would speak to us. Or through signs and and wonders, this this coincidences that come together, and that's how God speaks. It's the only way, but in doing so, in assuming that that's the only way that God speaks, we often will mistake our own thoughts for God's voice, and at the same time, we'll miss God speaking through the small things in life. It's the simple, the ordinary moments of life that oftentimes God will speak. Yes, of course, God speaks through big things, but he also speaks through small things. Perhaps you're asking, Rob, can you give an example? Well, let's turn to Scripture itself. If you want to look up the full story, look at the account of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. I'm going to summarize a few verses here, but Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, he is feeling a lot of discouragement, and he needs to hear God's voice. He needs to hear instruction from the Lord. He needs to feel encouragement from the Lord. He is feeling defeated. We'll actually come back to him at a different point in his life later on in the sermon. But in 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah needs to hear the Lord. So he goes and he stands on the mount where God often speaks. And at this moment, uh, God is telling him, told him to go to the mountain. God is about to speak to him, give him instruction, and a massive wind comes through and tears apart the mountain. Boulders flipping over. Of course, we could relate to the hurricanes that just happened in Florida, devastating the land, massive movements of wind. But God was not in the wind, the scripture tells us. Next, we see this massive earthquake happen. The ground splits apart and and the mountain crumbles again. A major thing that the scripture says, but God was not in the earthquake. And then we see a fire, a raging fire roaring through the land right by Elijah. And but scripture says, but God was not in the fire. And then after this, scripture says, Elijah heard a whisper, perhaps a more 
accurate description would be a thin silence. And it was in that thin silence, the whisper, that God spoke. And I love that before this thin silence, this whisper, there were massive things. We see a fire. Of course, we know that, that God spoke to Moses through the burning bush. So it's common for God to speak through fire, or at least it's happened in the past. We see the mountains shaking. God has spoken to Moses and other prophets through mountains shaking. We see his presence resting on a place and the ground shaking. So we know that God has spoken through that. We, of course, have seen uh, his uh, excuse me, we have seen literally the ground open up through an earthquake and swallow God's enemies. God has spoken through fire. He's spoken through wind. If you've been attending here, you might know that uh, the breath of God is the Holy Spirit. The breath meaning the wind. Oftentimes in Scripture, we see wind referring to the voice of God. So here we see a few examples of times that God has spoken in the past. An earthquake, a wind, a fire. But it wasn't none of these things that God spoke. He spoke through a whisper. I love this. God waited to speak until we're in silence. We're in our sermon series, Airplane Mode. And it's all about practicing spiritual disciplines, upon turning on airplane mode in our life. Not just on our phone, although that is helpful, but to say, hey, I'm going to block off distractions so that I can get before the Lord and pray and worship and rest. Most of the spiritual disciplines that we are talking about in this sermon series truthfully require silence and solitude. If we truly want to get before the Lord and have deep study in Scripture, well, we have to block out distractions. You can't study anything if there are a million things happening to you. You can't pray and have a two-way conversation if there's so much noise going on blocks out the voice of the other person talking to you similarly with the Lord. If we're letting distractions in, we'll never actually have a conversation with him. And so while silence and solitude are perhaps the hardest things for us to accomplish as believers, for anyone, not even a follower of Christ, they're some of the most essential things that we could ever do to give you a, a guideline and a roadmap of the sermon this morning, silence and solitude before God are essential for direction, for strength, for renewal, and clarity in life. You might say that's a lot. I could have included more. But silence and solitude are essential before God for direction in life, for strength in our life, for renewal, and for clarity. We're going to break apart each and every one of these today as we look at Scripture. I hope you have your Bibles with you. If you don't, that's okay. There's going to be a lot of flipping back and forth to different passages today. We'll be focusing a lot on the life of Jesus because I think a lot of us say, like, oh, do we actually need silent solitude? Do we actually need to practice these disciplines? And I would say that the most perfect man who ever lived, Jesus Christ himself, practiced these disciplines. And we are no better than him. So if he needed them, we absolutely need them. So let's look first at how silence and solitude are essential for direction and guidance in our life. I think many of us would probably agree that, that life is hard. At making decisions day after day after day it can be quite taxing. To need to make a decision, to need uh, to follow directions even. When we're given instruction on how to live our life or when we're given instructions on what we are or aren't to do, sometimes that's nice to have instructions, but then to follow them can be taxing. Oh, did I follow that step correctly? Did I, you know, you have the instructions to an Ikea bookshelf. Did I put that screw in? You don't find out until 30 steps later you didn't and you have to go buy a new bookshelf. So direction for decisions that we have to make and guidance for how we're to live our lives are hard and they are taxing things. And I think that we can look at Jesus today and see how he approached big decisions and how other characters in the Bible received instructions. So let's look at the life of Christ in Luke chapter 16, verses 12 through 13. Jesus, in this time, he's about to select his 12 disciples, a major decision in his life. And in these days, he, Jesus, says, went out to the mountain to pray. 
And all the night he continued in prayer to God. And when the day came, he called his disciples and chose for them twelve whom he named apostles. Jesus, of course, is the perfect Son of God. He knows all things. And yet, even before the biggest decision that he would make to start the church after his life, he went out and he prayed all night long. He forsook sleep to pray, to commune with his Father, to make the biggest decision of his life. Solitude provides the space to listen for God's direction. Before making important decisions, we need to align our heart with God's will. And so I ask you, when you're making a major decision in your life, when you have something coming up that you need to do, maybe it's related to your job, maybe it's related to how you're going to raise your kids, maybe it's related to a relationship, and you say, man, I just need some wisdom here. Are you actually taking some time to go into solitude, to pray and to align your heart with God's will. The word of God says that his, uh, his word is a lamp unto our feet, guide to our path. And so if we actually take that into consideration, then we would go before the Lord every time that we need to know what is my next step. How can I make sure that I am walking in line with the Lord? And I would simply say, how do you know that you're walking in line with the Lord? If you're aligned with his heart. And you get aligned with his heart when you take time aside from your busyness, from all the distractions in life, to spend time before him in prayer. To spend time reading his word, waiting for him to speak to you. Jesus spent all night praying before one of the biggest decisions of his life. We should do the same. Not only the big decisions, but the small decisions. We should make sure that we are trying to align our heart with the Lord before the decisions that we make in our life. Waking up every morning and saying, God, would you align my thoughts with your thoughts? Would you align my heart with your heart? And may I walk with you today. And we could look at the the flip side of of, uh, before a decision and look at guidance. What about when God gives instruction? What about when we're about to receive instruction? Well, look with me back in the Old Testament to Exodus chapter 24, verses 15 through 18. Looking at Moses and starting in verse 15, it says, Then Moses went up to the mountain, to the cloud that covered the, um, the glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses, that is, God called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain, in the sight of the people of Israel. Again, we see God speaking through things like fire. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. It's a long time to be in solitude. It's a long time to be separated from other people. But after those 40 days, that is when God gave the Ten Commandments. Many of you would, of course, know those. Foundations of our faith. The law. But it took 40 days of Moses being in solitude with the Lord to receive those commandments. Like Moses, we can enter into silence to encounter God's presence and receive his instructions. So if you're wondering, man, what should I do? I need God to tell me what to do. Again, I ask the question, are you retreating? Are you creating space to hear God's commands, to hear his direction in your busy lives? See, all too often when we want God to speak to us, we want his direction, but we aren't willing to wait. You might say, well, God doesn't need us to be quiet. God doesn't need us to be silent. God doesn't need us to have isolation. He's God. He could just speak. And if you're anything like me, you've been frustrated before when God, being God, doesn't just speak to you. Like, God, I have this major decision. Why won't you just tell me what to do? It's frustrating sometimes. I think it's frustrating because we as humans want things to be quick. We want to find a solution and solve the problem. And if we can't find the solution quickly, we decide to solve it on our own, oftentimes making a mistake. And so God, in his infinite wisdom, has said, yes, I could just tell you audibly to do this. But I'm going to make you be patient. 
I'm going to test your character. I'm going to help you grow. Because if I just give you things quickly, time after time after time, soon you're going to think that you're doing it on your own will. Soon we're going to think as humans that, well, I always come up with the right decision right away, so of course it's just me because we're selfish. We're not able to give the correct glory to the Lord. But when God actually makes us slow down, slow down enough that it is frustrating, and then he speaks, we have no choice but to give glory to him because we realize it was not our own doing. I can give a practical example of Eros Church. The times that we've had to wait on him. You may remember for a few months we were meeting at Tiburon Golf Course. Well, we actually found that place pretty much last minute. We were being uh, kicked out, so to speak, of the high school before that because of a policy they had in place that churches and businesses could only gather there for a year. And our contract was up. They actually extended some grace, gave us some more time. But we were on a, a crunch to get out of there. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a place to meet. We were calling around. We were trying to find a place to meet. But we also knew that the only way that it would happen is if we trusted in the Lord. And so as staff, we intentionally took time to pray, to fast, to wait on him. And at seemingly the last minute, Tiburon opened up. We heard about them and it worked. That's just a practical example of, of God requiring us just to slow down a little bit to wait on him, to wait and to rely on God. Silence and solitude is essential for direction in our life. Next, let's examine how silence and solitude before God are essential for strength and comfort in grief. I don't have to tell you that grief is a part of life. If you've lived really any amount of time, you've probably had grief over something. Perhaps it's the loss of a loved one, Perhaps it's the loss of a job. Many, many things that can cause grief. Crushing weight of responsibility. Whatever it is, grief is something that there is no escaping of. We can try to avoid it. We can try to shove our grief to the side, but that's only going to make the problem worse. So how do we handle grief? How do we handle loss? What are we supposed to do? Well, again, let's look to what Jesus did. Scripture says that he was acquainted with our grief. He lived a full life on earth, meaning that he experienced loss. There are a few places we could go, but I want to look at Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 through, oh, sorry, we'll just be looking at one verse, but the whole passage is 14, 1 through 13, if you want to read it on your own. But this is after John the Baptist had been beheaded, was killed. And verse says this, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there to a boat, to a desolate place by himself. Jesus heard the news of a loved one. John the Baptist was in fact his cousin. Likely when they were kids, they would have played together. They would have had fun together. I know me and my cousins growing up, we had a lot of fun. They were some of my closest friends. And Jesus knew him well. He was a close friend. John was the one that baptized Jesus. What a special moment. I don't know if many of you have been baptized, but how wonderful is it when a close friend can be the one that baptizes you? John the Baptist was that for Jesus. And so John had, had died, and Jesus here needed some time alone. He needed time to weep. Another part of Scripture, the shortest verse in the Bible Another close friend of Jesus, Lazarus, dies, and it says that Jesus wept. Jesus was acquainted with our grief. Jesus himself needed time away. Silence and solitude are vital for dealing with grief. We can't run from it. We shouldn't try to avoid it. We should press into it. Get away from distractions. Go before the Lord and give him our sorrow. Give him our grief. Another example, perhaps not one of loss. Maybe you're saying, hey, I haven't lost anybody yet, but I feel defeated, and sometimes that defeat is crushing. We can look to Elijah, an Old Testament prophet. He had defeat in the wilderness. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 4 through 8. But he, Elijah, went away a day's journey 
into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and he slept under that tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was in his hand a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he rose, ate, and he drank, and went in strength of the food that day, and 40 nights, 40 days and 40 nights. And I think that a lot of us can relate to Elijah in this. Life gets crushing and we just lie down and say, I just wish that it was done. Let me look at Elijah. It is enough. Let me die. A little bit dramatic, perhaps. But in this moment, Elijah is facing defeat. He literally has the rulers of the land chasing him, wanting to kill him for the uh, things that he is saying, the things that God is commanding him to say to the king and to the queen of the land. And they are chasing after him, wanting him dead. And so the defeat of Elijah is so strong in this moment that he just wants to lie down in the desert and die. That's all he wants. He's grieving how Israel has run away from the Lord. He's grieving the fact that the rulers of the land want him dead. And he just wants death. I love how God strengthened him for the journey. And he did this by, by a few things. Two of them most obvious, food and sleep. What a great life, life lesson. You feel defeated, you feel burnt out, get some sleep, get some food, repeat. It's literally what we see outlined here. Elijah wanted death. God said, okay, you're being a bit dramatic. Here's some food, here's some sleep, here's some water. Do it again the next day. All right, you're good to go. I think a lot of us could, could relate to that. Just get some time away. Just get some rest. Eat some good food. I want to ask the question, in our lowest moments, are we allowing God to renew our strength? God provided the meal God provides for us the rest that we need. Far too often, uh, we fill these wilderness moments, we could say, with things to distract us from actually getting alone with the Lord. We feel so defeated, so we just go on our phone and start scrolling. We feel so defeated, so we just decide to fill our time with meaningless things. Things that in the moment just make us go completely blank, not thinking, those things don't actually renew us. How many of you have actually felt genuinely refreshed after an hour of scrolling on your phone? I doubt any of you. I know I don't. I always feel worse. Sure, there might be some laughs from a few videos that I saw, but then I continue on, and next thing I know, I feel more tired than I did before. In these wilderness moments like Elijah where we just feel a crushing defeat, we need to just be willing to hear the voice of the Lord and follow the instructions that he gives us to find strength and comfort in our grief. Uh, lastly, before we move on, I do, I do love the honesty, though, from Elijah here. He cries out before the Lord. He shows his real and raw emotion. When was the last time that we showed emotion before the Lord? Men, when was the last time that you actually cried before God? I'm not saying that you need to open up your life to everybody around you. I'm not saying that you need to show emotion to everyone in your life. Some, sure. But when was the last time that you actually wept before the Lord in your grief? Elijah here shows that that's something that even a mighty man of God does. To weep before the Lord. And it's in that moment of vulnerability but the Lord speaks. Here's some food, here's some water, rest, renew your strength. It's in those moments of vulnerability before the Lord where he can say, hey, here's some spiritual food for you. Here's my presence, here's my love. Rest, renew your strength. And this leads us to our next point that silence and solitude are vital for renewal and rejuvenation. And we have grief. We go before the Lord. We get alone before him. And in that time, he will renew us and restore our strength. 
We see again, Jesus modeled this perhaps more than anybody else. Throughout all of the gospel accounts, we see numerous times. We can look at Mark first, where it says that rising very early in the morning when it was still dark, he being Jesus, departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Jesus would recharge in prayer. Throughout Scripture, we see time and time again, rising early in the morning or staying up all night. Those are Jesus' two major times. You might ask, why? Because that's when the rest of the world was asleep. Perhaps some of you are saying, man, Rob, I would love to have silence. I would love to have solitude, but I have little kids, and there's no way that I could ever get that. And I hear you. But are you doing everything possible to get even just a few moments alone before the Lord while your kids are sleeping? Jesus would forsake sleep often to go before the Lord in prayer. That's how he was able to do ministry. That's how he was able to preach as much as he did and and able to do what he did on, on earth. Sure, he was fully God, but he was also fully human, which meant that he felt tiredness. He felt exhaustion. And yet he knew that spiritual exhaustion was far more damaging than physical exhaustion. He knew that if his heart wasn't aligned with his father, that there was no chance that his ministry would be effective. And so for us today, physical exhaustion, it's a real thing, and I get it. And it can be damaging to our work sometimes. But if our spirit is dry, if our heart is dry before the Lord, we have no hope. We have no hope to actually be effective as a Christian. Jesus would recharge in prayer. So are we setting aside solitude? Daily routines for spiritual growth and strength. Silence and solitude before God are essential for renewal and rejuvenation. Next, we see that they are essential for clarity and readiness. For clarity and readiness. I think often when we're going into a big season, we're going into something next. Maybe it's a new job. Maybe it's a a new city that we're going to live in. Maybe some of you are about to have a child. Maybe you're about to get married. A big decision to have clarity stepping into that new season, to have readiness to, to enter into it with excellence, we need to have time before the Lord. Perhaps you're seeing a pattern that in every area of life, you need time before the Lord in silence and solitude. Jesus himself, Matthew 26, right before he is about to be crucified on the cross. It says this in Matthew 26, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. This is the biggest thing that would ever happen to Jesus. The biggest moment in human history. Jesus' death on the cross. His brutal crucifixion. Giving all of us salvation. Who would trust in him as Lord and Savior. And in this moment, Jesus goes and he finds solitude. And he goes and he prays before the Lord. Jesus himself needed time leading into a massive trial. He needed to be ready. He needed to have clarity that this was God's will. We see later on that he says, God, if it's possible, let this cup, meaning let this event pass, but not my will, but your will be done. Jesus needed clarity that it was, in fact, his Father's will. He knew it, but he didn't want it to happen. How often for all of us do we know what we need to do? Do we know what God is calling us to do, but we don't want it to happen? How many of us have avoided what God is calling us to because we don't take time before the Lord to gather our strength, to gain clarity, and to prepare ourselves to be ready? Do you see solitude as a place to prepare yourself for the new season ahead? So as we reflect on on solitude, as we reflect on this, I want you to evaluate your current practice of seeking silence and solitude. I want to give you a very practical way that you can put this into routines and rhythms throughout your daily life. I don't have a slide for it, but I want you to write this down to put it in your phone, put it somewhere. And it's this, to divert daily, to get away for a few minutes every day, whether it's five minutes, whether it's 20 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, Divert daily. Get away before the Lord and sit with him. Sit in silence if you need to. Pray. So divert daily. Withdraw weekly 
withdraw weekly. This is Sabbath practice, where we can get away from our responsibilities, have a true day of rest, to fill that day of rest with things that actually give us life, to actually withdraw from the things of this world. Sure, you can, you can hang out with friends, you can do things that give you life, but once a week, withdraw weekly from your responsibilities. And then lastly, abandon annually. It's a vacation, right? Abandon annually. Take time in your life, maybe as a family unit or yourself even, to say, hey, I'm going to take a, a week, a few days, whatever it is, to completely separate myself from my entire environment, and I'm going to abandon before the Lord at least once a year. I would say this would go above the family vacation. This is dedicated time, not just for fun, but to get before the Lord and say, hey, as a family, we are going to take a few days, get out of our city, and we're going to go worship God. We're going to spend intentional, extended time in prayer. Abandon annually. So divert daily, withdraw weekly, and abandon annually. It's a practical way to put silence and solitude into practice. Jesus modeled what this looks like. The prophets and people in the Old Testament modeled that they needed silence and solitude before the Lord. We're going to put it into practice even this morning. I invite the worship team to to come up on stage. I'm going to close us in prayer in a moment. The worship team is actually just going to sit in silence. The only noise you'll hear might be the kids in the background. I encourage you to stay in your seats, go in a posture of prayer, and ask the Lord to speak. Perhaps you need direction, guidance for a big decision coming up. Ask him that he would help guide you. Perhaps you need strength. Maybe you're grieving something this morning. You're grieving the loss of a loved one. Maybe you're grieving a new season. I think it's completely okay to to grieve even when you haven't lost anything. Just to grieve that something is different. Maybe some of you, you need clarity. You need clarity for something coming up, a trial that you might be facing soon. And in the next few moments while the worship team is getting ready to sing, bring those things to the Lord and ask him to speak sit in uncomfortable silence, because it's in those moments that I believe God will speak. After a few moments, the worship team will will sing a song, stay seated while they are, continue to to reflect and to pray before the Lord. And then after that, we'll, we'll close our service this morning. But would you pray with me right now? Father, I acknowledge that silence is hard. In an ever fast-paced world, in a fast-changing place that we live, silence is one of the hardest things that we can do. But God, we see that it's essential for our growth. We see that it's essential to have clarity in life, to have strength in life, to have direction and guidance. So God, would we make a habit of diverting daily to spend time with you? of resting, withdrawing weekly to have a true rest with you. And God, I even pray that we would make a habit out of abandoning annually intentional time praying, intentional time in your word. God, would you speak this morning? And would we have ears to hear? Pray all of this in Jesus' name.